We ready? All right, this is Margaret Lark Russell telling us, ka-ching, how to make real money. Please. Thank you, thank you. And uh, before I start, I want to second John by saying the Hackers for Charity table has got some absolutely awesome new stuff that just came in. Please, even if you've already shopped there, shop there again. It's a great cause, and the stuff is just amazing. It will blow people away when you bring it home. And as a matter of housekeeping, I will be taking questions throughout live if they're short questions. And if it's a discussion kind of question, can we save it to the end? OK, so it's been a great con. And I've heard just tons and tons and tons of fantastic ideas and things that are going to be eventually great products or are great products. And the question is, what's next? How do you keep the business going? How do you keep energy going? And how do you get that technology into the marketplace and have it used and earn money for you? And the big thing is, don't be afraid of money. I've heard a lot of people say here, oh my god, I can't sell out. Well, it's not selling out. Money is really, really useful stuff. It's nearly endlessly transmutable into the things you really want, like electricity, computers, more bandwidth. And that's pretty cool stuff. So, oh, and it also pays the rent. This is, this is also a very positive thing. And one of the ways to sell is try to go up against the big guys. They have lots and lots of practice at making money. And they're very good in the competitive marketplace. So today, I'm basically going to talk about what the sales process is, and how it's wired, and how to win, and basically how shit works. <laughs> so um, also, too, throughout this talk, I'm, because I'm going to have to call what you guys do something, I'm calling what you do a company. Partly because I call it a company because I want you to think of it in terms of the business. And partly because I don't know what else to say. You and your friends and associates, your startup, your cabal, whatever. So your company. So forgive me for that if it doesn't quite ring true. Also, I'm going to have to limit myself to just talking about one portion of the sales cycle. There's a lot to selling. My expertise happens to be in RFIs, RFPs, and RFQs. And to unfold those acronyms, it's a request for information, a request for proposal, and a request for quote. Um, a lot of times when small companies are cultivating leads, uh, particularly vendors have enormous influence on the RFP and its content and its focus. And the potential buyer um, in discussing with the large companies, um, they need to describe the problem and they need to describe the technical requirements to solve it. And they actually might uh, submit portions of the RFP. The, the, the seller might submit, submit portions of the RFP that you might eventually wind up having to answer. And that can be really kind of weird because they basically have more clout than you do. Uh, they also have huge tons of personnel. They have sale, hundreds and hundreds of sales reps. They have sales engineers. They have sales supports. They have vast, enormous back offices, tons of practice in doing this stuff. Um, and they also usually have very large proposal departments. I've been in places where the proposal department is pushing 100 people, and that was just one division of this very large company. I've also been in places where the proposal department is five or six people backed up with about 100 people that are on call. So there's tons and tons and tons of just, just enormous competition out there, but there is a way around it. And they have it down cold. You have to learn it. And the thing is, it can be learned. It's a skill. It's a craft. It's just another skill set. If you can code, you can probably write a successful proposal because it's very, very learnable. And the thing is, I can't tell you how to make doing a proposal be less onerous, less horrible, less sucky. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh god, I hate doing proposals. People here, possibly in the audience, saying because they're just dreadful to do. Um, OK, sorry, we're having a bit of a sound problem. OK. Are we better now? 
Okay, half a moment. Your patience, please. Okay. Um, where was I? Oh, right. Uh, let's, let's repeat the, the cuss word. That's always lots of fun. I can't tell you how to make it suck less, but I can tell you how to make it successful. And am I going to have to go through that sentence again? Good heavens. <laughs> okay. When the customer is trying to purchase something, they have a sales cycle. It's a pretty long, involved sales cycle. It's full of rules, and the customer defines the rules. If, it, uh, if, it's, if it's a business customer, they define the rules. And a lot of times, if it's a large customer, they are actually in there on the slide. Before we get to, before we get to the bullet points, that's when the large uh, sales organization is actually inserts itself into the process. You, however, probably won't be able to get down until they're looking at an RFI. Maybe if you've got a really good business development manager, you will. Maybe not because you're still small and you probably aren't fully staffed out yet. But it doesn't matter because the whole purpose of an RFI, RFP, RFQ process is to level the playing field so that the customer gets to buy the, the piece of technology or services that actually solves their problems. So if you've got that magic thing, if you have the thing that works, if you have the thing that makes them happy, you are better off than the, big, than the big guy because you can actually make them happy and the big guy can't. And part of your ability to succeed is because you're a little guy, you basically have more flexibility, you have more ability to change, you have more ability to um, have a, a business that's not just very good and very smart, but very agile. The big companies, they can't turn on a dime. Their teams are typically pushed down to the lower levels. As a small company, you can have the president of the company, you can have the CTO, the CIO on your proposal team and make decisions that stick and make, make uh, Check. Check. decisions and responses that actually talk about what your company is, what it does, and how it can help the customer. And you don't have to have it vetted through 30 or 40 levels of management. You can just say it because you're the guy. You're the, you're the one responsible. And I think that's really incredible. Um, I hate the word empowerment, but there are times when, you know, by gosh, it's actually really, really useful stuff. And more microphones. Boy, OK. I'm beginning to feel like the president up here doing State of the Union. <laughs> Okay, um, there's basically two kinds of customers you're going to be looking at. Businesses, that's B2B, and government, that's B2G. Uh, typically a B2B process, the, gov the business itself defines what the process is. And in a B2G response, the government has all sets of rules and regulations and you have to follow them. In whatever case you're dealing with, whoever sets the rules as the responder these are the rules. You can't uh, do uh, Kobayashi Maru. You've got to absolutely stick to what's happening. You can't change it. And um, yeah, that's kind of cool in a way, because everybody gets the same rules, which does level the playing field, because the other guys can't change the rules either. Now, I talked a little bit about RFI, RFP, and RFQ before. One of the big differences um, in them, besides you know, what the initials mean is, whether or not there's price involved, if you're talking money, if you're talking anything contractual that will eventually wind up if you're successful in a contract, it's an RFP or an RFQ, and anything you say in that is legally binding. So if you promise you will send 20 engineers for 20 weeks, you've got to do that. And so be careful of what you say in these things. If you say your product is X, you have to do it, and you have to deliver that as standard what it does. It can't be a, it can't be a um, custom job and that you charge them for. You absolutely have to deliver, because otherwise you'll find yourself in total contract hell. Um, and one of the other things is there's an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Almost any company will give you an NDA before you can receive their RFI, RFP, or RFQ. Let's call it an RFX from now on. It's, that's cool by you guys. Um, they want to give you an NDA that you have to sign because they want to protect, usually, what they're in trouble with and what they need to solve because that, for them, is a business issue that they want to keep kind of close 
And that's cool, and you can sign it and get in on the process. But you probably want an NDA, too, before you respond. The reason you want an NDA that covers you, or a mutual NDA, is because if you're telling about what your product is, what your process is, what your service is going to be, and you're giving away any of your business secrets or your special sauce, or you're telling, uh, you know, you have to include uh, the resumes of some of your personnel, you might want to keep some of this stuff as part of your corporate intellectual property and keep it protected. So this will allow you to protect yourself and keep your business alive. Now, a lot of governments, they don't allow an NDA they, because they have to publish uh, what's happening. They have to, part of the uh, purchase cycle for government purchases is they have to make the process transparent to the public. But they will, in many cases, allow redaction, which is basically anything you write, you can then give them a purely clean and clear copy that they can read and review, and also a copy that's all blacked out. And that is what they publish online if you have that agreement with them. And that's a pretty cool tool, too, to protect your property. OK. Now, when you're finally, you've gotten the RFI, and you've decided um, this is the thing I'm going to look at, what you need to do is not immediately jump into it. You need to read it very, very carefully and think about it. And while you're thinking about it and working on it, you need to look at the entire process, look at the deadline, look at what they're asking for, look at the schedule, and ask if it's possible for you to do this. And the big thing is you have to research the customer completely and thoroughly, whether it's a business or a government. You also have to research the competition. One of the things you're looking for when you're doing this research is, is if it's a business, and particularly if it's a publicly held business, does the competition and does the customer have interlocking directorates? In other words, if there's people on the board of both companies, your chances of actually winning have just kind of plummeted a little bit because they probably have a preferred vendor. This is really a drag, but it's one of the things of business. And by researching, your customer, by researching the customer and researching the competition, you learn this stuff and you learn how to work with it. Because if you have the data, you can figure out what to do. Or you can figure out, you know, I think I'm not going to put my energy here because this is probably not a really great thing to do. And that's OK, because backing off from something that's not going to work for you is really very smart a lot of the time. Because there's always more uh, things that you can do later. There's always, there's always another possible sale coming down the line. And one of the things I want you to really look for, too, when you're reading and reread the RFP, this is insanely boring. I admit it up front. It's like perfect to put yourself to sleep with, but you can't sleep, really, because this is important. You're looking to make money. You're looking to keep your company alive. You want to find out what problems they're trying to solve, because you need to match up what your capabilities are with their problems, and can you genuinely solve it? This kind of seems like a no-brainer. You'd be surprised at the number of huge businesses that just sort of say, oh, we're a really big guy. We can solve all your problems. No problem. We're cool. And then they can't, except they claim they can, and they wave their hands, and they say magic things, and they take somebody out to play golf. You're not about to do that. And uh, it gets weird out there. Typical items in an RFP, um, when you get the document in, there's going to be things that you're going to have to provide as part of the answer. Um, and they are all determined in the RFP. You have to answer everything. You have to answer everything completely. Um, and you might be kind of unfamiliar with some of the chunks that are in it. And these are typical chunks. One of the most important things is the letter of transmittal, which seems kind of like, huh, what the heck is that? And what's its purpose? Uh, this basically says that my company is responding to your RFP. The person who is signing this letter is empowered to sign this letter. This, the person who's signing it is committing this company, our company, <coughs> to what we are saying in this, that we understand that this is a contract or will be added to a contract, and we are perfectly willing to get into this and do it. And um, that's just... It's legalese. A lot of people turn it into a sales letter. Please don't do that. Uh, start working on your executive overview immediately. 
Um, and when you do that, because you're developing it over time, also start working on your costing immediately because you are constantly, chronically, until the moment you ship this sucker, you are in a go, no go situation. At any point, you might want to pull the plug. And this is also is a perfectly wonderful, valid, and smart thing to do. Because until you ship it, until it's in their hands, you are not legally bound. And at any point, saying, no, we're not going to go there is cool. Saying, yeah, we're going to go there is also, is also valid if you think you are going to continue to make this thing happen. And uh, one of the problems a smaller company, a newer company, is going to have is almost all the time they ask for what's your company history and what is your, um, what is your plan in case you go out of business. And they look at the big guys, and the big guys have been in business 20, 30, 40, 100 years, and they have a continuance plan for their products and services. You have to think about that. What are you going to do? This is not your exit strategy. This is how are you going to continue to support customers that you've got, because this is critical to getting business. So if you haven't already thought about that, please think about it, brainstorm, sit down and figure it out, because it's really critical to getting business into the house. Uh, there's technical questions, there's service questions. I'm pretty sure you've got those knocked already. If they're asking for personnel, especially if you're doing services or installation, they'll probably ask for uh, small resumes. Keep them short, keep them brief, make sure that they uh, just sort of prove that the person can do the job. You don't have to give, you know, they dig baseball and they have a dog named Sam. That's just completely not, not part of it. So you've decided that maybe, and you're starting to populate the team. You're looking at a schedule, and one of the problems you're going to run into with a schedule is they're going to give you six, eight, 12 weeks to do it maximum, and you're going to look at everything you need to do and say, oh my god, we can't do this. You know, I just ran it through Microsoft Project, and it's not going to work, because everything that is typically a dependent project, you have to start before actually all the dependencies are met simply because you want to make this deadline. So you have to stack things up enormously and start them even without having complete data sets. And just do it. It's a little scary, but what the heck. And keep going and coordinate and communicate and also keep checking on your due date because this is, this is the holy grail. Blowing the due date means everything you've done, forget it. So what you're looking for when you're populating a team are a couple of critical roles. I don't, these are not um, organizational roles, these are project roles. And I'm trying to figure out how to cut typically a very, very large team down to the essential roles. And these are the essential roles, at least in the gospel, according to me. Um, and actually, it works, because I've done it with very small teams, and it does work, because um, I have messed with a couple of really small companies and gotten them sales, so that's cool. Um, and I want you to just kind of think of these three roles. The business lead person should be as high up in your organization as you can possibly get this person. This person should have lots and lots of decision-making ability. This could be the person who signs your letter, letter of transmittal. This person needs to have juice in your company because you might have to make a couple of decisions really quickly and act on them and work them out. Um, so this person, if you have uh, some kind of C-level organization needs to be able to go there and have the juice to, to make this stuff go. Response lead can be anybody, engineer, tech writer, whatever, somebody who has all the capabilities. I'm going to get into specific um, uh, requirements for what they need to do in a, in a moment. And basically an editor. And this person does no writing. You want them to be really clean and fresh. And so the business lead, this is, this is, your, this is your, your top guy. Um, and I say guy, that's kind of gender neutral. I hope you realize it's probably a woman, would be my guess. Um, one of the real critical things in any proposal process is you've got to be a really, really fast, good, competent reader. This kind of sounds silly. Everyone knows how to read. But there's reading, and then there's huge reading comprehension, and there's ability to really read and pull the juice out of what they're actually looking for and keep on focus with that. And when I say high threshold of boredom, too, I mean it, because you're going to be reading not just what they give you to answer, but your own answers time and time and time again. 
And this person, with the pursue or not to pursue, the go, no go decision, is going to be asking themselves constantly, every step of the way, a whole pile of questions. And do not stop asking these questions. You are asking them chronically. And this is really important. Because um, as you're developing data, as you're developing answers, you need to always be balancing what are we doing here and why are we doing it. If you can't continually answer those questions with a yes, then stop. Um, when you get into the person who is actually doing the writing and they're doing a lot of organization, they're collecting writing, you might uh, have divvied up the questions to 20 people or however many people in your organization. They're putting it all together, they're making it work together. Um, and this person is going to be nagging the heck out of everybody. If they don't nag, you don't want them in this role because they have got to be strong, they've got to be pushy. They have got to make everybody behave. They have got to say, I'm sorry, you can't go home until you give me that, that response, because that's really, really critical to keeping things online. And if I'm getting a little too weird and too deep in here, just let me know, and I'll kind of you know, go up a couple of layers of oxygen here. Um, talked a little, about, a little bit about an NDA earlier. I want to mention, not, not just mention, I really want to drill it into you, that you need corporate counsel if you're doing an RFP or, or an RFQ, because lawyers in some situations can totally, totally save your butt. Don't be afraid of lawyers. Don't be afraid of what they charge. Because when you're in a competitive sales situation, what they save you is, oh my god, so worth it. You really want them to weigh in. You want them to know what you're doing, what you're saying. You want them to know what the contract will be. A general, a good corporate general counsel will help you with any contractual issues. I'll talk a little bit more about lawyers later, but they are just so, so terribly useful. Um, and there's other kinds of lawyers who you want to be thinking of if you are trying to do serious business and you're at the point now of making sales. Um, you want to have a contract lawyer. You probably want to have an intellectual property lawyer. These can sometimes be the same person, not necessarily. You might want to have an export lawyer if you're trying to sell stuff overseas. It doesn't matter, you know, if, especially if you're an American citizen or an American company trying to sell to other companies, uh, countries rather, I'm sorry. Um, and sometimes, too, you need somebody to help you with export licenses for software, especially if this is going to run into security. Guess what? And then you might need a patent lawyer. That's, that's the fun guy. He's going to really give you uh, corporate intellectual property. So OK, after that slight diversion back to RFPs. Uh, the editor person. This person should really have no writing um, responsibilities at all. The main thing you want them to do is to make sure that you have answered every single question. A lot of questions come in multiple parts. You want to answer every single part of the question in order to be compliant. One of the ways they kick you out is if you are non-compliant. You can miss a tiny, tiny little thing. And if they're looking to kick you out, they will. And you will have no recourse. A lot of cases you can um, say, hey, wait a minute, why were you kicked out? And if they point out that a discrepancy, you're host. You really have no way to come back. This is particularly true in, in government purchasing. And. I cannot believe I'm going to say what I'm now going to say. Um, I was an English major a long time ago. The last edit is going to be for grammar and spelling, and I'm now going to be thrown out of the, the uh, secret cadre of English majors. Um, it's much more important to have a compliance review to answer every question and sub-question. Also, if you're going to have to demonstrate the product, which is often part of the requirement for making a sale, Talk to your demo team. Talk to, talk to find out what they're demoing and make sure what you're saying in the response and what you're showing in the demo completely jive and support each other and really help make the sales case. One of the other things you're going to be working on and that the editor is going to be checking for is that you are responding in a, in a way that's competitive. Are you showing off your features? Are you making your, your product and services look really good? And if you know who the competition is, which frequently you can find out, if you know what they're selling and you know what their product is probably going to be, you can actually sneak in some things that will help you basically fend them off a little bit. And I'll show you about that in, in a few minutes. 
And after you've got all that, now you can do the grammar and spelling and make it really good because one of the things is if you have poor grammar, poor spelling, poor layout, you're not going to look professional. And at this point, you are professional. You are playing with the big boys. So you really, really, really need to go for that. But only after you've got everything else. Okay. And I've talked a little bit about answering all possible points, you have to get them. They almost all responses are graded by some poor guy who is sitting with a pile of these suckers on his desk and he's reading them even if they're 100 pages or 200 pages each and he's going through the scorecard and he's checking boxes. Be his friend, make his life easy. Use a good typeface and make it easy to find each answer because you just don't want them to hate you because you're making it hard for them. It's like, why would they hate me? Well, because they're at it for two weeks and they're bored silly and you just, <laughs> you need more people on your team. And part of the thing too is you really want them to know constantly in all of your answers that you are paying attention to their needs, you are paying attention to what they're trying to solve and that you are solving it in every single answer you give. So this is kind of a joke, but this is, I was talking about uh, questions that have multiple questions built in. And so my belief is that you start a, an answer with the easiest possible scoring. You can say fully compliant, you can say meets requirements, you can say yes, we do that. But the, the, and that works because that will get you the check in the score box immediately before the, before the reviewer glazes over. There's some disagreement about this technique. A lot of people want to front load the response with two or three pages of marketing ease. I really, really think that that's a bad idea because you really want the check in the checkbox more than anything else. Um, the drawback to it, though, is you have to be really consistent. You're basically, every answer you can write the exact same, you know, fully compliant or meets requirement or whatever, you do it because you're setting up Yes, 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 in the reviewer. The problem is, if there's a place where you don't, it really, really stands out. So you have to, two things, remember to put it in every place where you are and be really careful where you're not. Um, if you think you're like a 50-50 balance, why, why are you responding to that RFP? And um, there's a little joke in there, but if you look up the, um, the thing, you'll find it. Um, one of the other ways to handle answers is um, you can add your own features. This is a way to build additional points and get, yes, we meet and we also exceed. Uh, so you're, you're pointing out one of your features. And also another way is never do this as the first answer. Uh, if you can do a small dig at one of your competitors and never, ever, ever mention your competitor by name, uh, is just say, you know, hey, there's something, you know, that is a problem with some of the things you're asking for. Here's why we think it is. And if at all possible, uh, give it a third party attribution. I've kind of joked a little and said MIT report because I used to edit it. So other than that, forget it. Um, but you want that third party attribution at the highest level you possibly can. Because you're not saying it, the experts are, even if you are the expert. Okay. Now, uh, pricing and deal reviews. This is a place where a lot of small companies screw up and it's a problem because the big guys don't screw it up. They've been working on doing pricing and deal reviews and costing for years. They have all kinds of tables. They have it all worked out. They know to the dime what it's going to cost them to send somebody out in the field and you don't know that yet. You're working on your costing formula. And one of the I pretty much listed on the slide, and by the way, the slides will be available after, so you know, don't, don't, don't worry about like, frantically taking notes. Make sure you list absolutely everything you're going to be selling or supplying, and make sure that you pay attention to how much the cost of the cost is, because you are running a back office as well as a sales office, and you need to take every single penny you're going to spend on that sale into account. And if you decide you're going to undersell what your actual cost is, that's fine, that's your business decision. But make it a business decision, don't make it an oh damn oops. How are we doing on time? 35 minutes after. Oh my god, okay. We've got about 20 minutes. <laughs> 
think I'm going a little fast here. Um, eventually, you'll get to the point where you have gotten everything done. You've uh, just reviewed the heck out of it. You've made sure that you are completely responsive. You have gotten it perfectly well edited. All the bits and pieces are there. Everybody's happy. It fits your business plan. It fits your business model. You're not going to send your company down a strange lane that you hadn't planned on going just simply to make this RFP work. And you're going to be thinking of, okay, we're going to ship this sucker pretty soon. Now, if they ask for paper copies, they might ask for, oh, 20 or 25 copies. It's not unusual. This is going to be a very expensive RFP. This is part of your decision. Do it anyway. The real problem is, if you're serious about shipping it out, you are actually making three copies. Yeah. <laughs> I, sw I swear. You're going to need one paper copy for your own records. This doesn't have to be quite as fancy, but it's, you need to keep this and retain this for legal reasons. You're going to need one paper copy to ship, because you have to ship it to them on time. And you have to have a contingency plan so that if, by God, it doesn't get there on time, you have somebody who can courier it over, you know, somebody on your staff who jumps on an airplane late at night with a really big suitcase or two or three suitcases or two or three people carrying two or three suitcases in order to meet the requirements because you've just gone crazy doing this response. You don't want to not ship it because, oh my gosh, you know, hey, it didn't get there, FedEx messed up. Um, if it's an online response, Often it's as easy as pushing a button and sending an email with a, with a receipt confirmation, not a problem. However, there's more and more movement to uh, doing web-based responses where you have to fill in the blanks and it, some of them don't work very well. Find out beforehand if it doesn't work very well, find out what the glitches are, become really good friends with the person who's administering the, the web portal for responses. A lot of times the government is using more and more web portaling because they're trying to get paperless. The problem is when it doesn't work and you're up against a deadline. Um, so play with it first and make sure that you actually can provide what you're doing on time. Because uh, why bother if you don't? Okay. Now, when you have shipped and you think you are ready to relax and have a beer or have a scotch or whatever and get some sleep finally. Do that for a little while. The most important thing you are doing is you are building up corporate intellectual property. I want you to start a spreadsheet with the very first RFP. Look at whether or not you decide to respond to it. And what you're putting onto the spreadsheet is you are putting on the company name, what they're looking for, why they're looking for it, uh, if you have the document in hand, what the name of the document is, and you should have one single place in your corporate server where you store these things. You should include in this what they're looking for and how you match it or don't match it. This is really important. I, you know, kind of eyes everybody. I know by now you're probably glazed over. You want to know Am I responding? Am I not responding? Why am I not? Does my product set match what they're looking for? Does my product set not? Are they looking for services I don't currently have? It's okay if you don't currently have this stuff, but you need to note it and you need to take as many notes as possible. If it's a response that you do do or get halfway through, continue to take all this information. What's going to happen after a while is you're going to start winning a couple of these things. You need to put them in and say, I won this one. Otherwise, you need to know who won it. You can usually find this stuff out. If it's a government thing, you can find it through government portals. If it's a business thing, very often they do a press release. It's really cool. You just Google it and find it. You want this information so that you start building up serious, serious database of your field, your competition, your potential customers, what your product is and how it stacks up. And these, these pieces of information are really valuable because when you're trying to figure out how am I going to further develop my product, you look at the spreadsheet and you think, wow, you know, there were 40 RFPs I could have responded to, but I really could only respond to three because my product or service is insufficient for what's the demand in the market. 
and this can help guide how you develop your product or your services. If you're discovering that there's another competitor out there who is basically just wiping up the field and eating your lunch, study them. You need to know who this guy is and figure out what it is about them that is making them prevail against you every single darn bloody time. And this is gold. You don't, you don't ever want to lose this. You want to keep this in your most secure place. And just, just keep it forever and ever and ever. And when you eventually get big enough to start having systems like a customer relationship management system, you can dump some of this in there. You can use it for product development, as I've said. This is all competitive info. This, this is golden. This is really why you do RFPs. Yeah, you do them to get business, but you also do them to get data and information. This is why you comb through RFPs even if you know you're not going to be responding to them because you want to collect this data. It's really, you yeah, know, it's kind of boring to read through them all, but my gosh, the data you, you acquire from reading these things and responding is just enormous and from following up because a lot of companies send them out into the ether. They never follow up. They have no idea who won. They have no idea. The, the press release will often say, we went with vendor XYZ because they met our service expectations or because their product was unique. You want to capture those questions. You want to capture that, those chunks of data too because those will really, really help you in the future with your company. Do not ever, ever, ever not do this. Uh, another thing that you're looking to do when you're uh, gearing up for next time. You're looking at this and you're also looking at what was our process. You want to do afterward, always you want to do a, uh, why am I fogging on the word? Anyway, you want to do a post-mortem on the process. How did it work? What were our problems? Because you're looking for incremental improvement in your proposal process. Because it will get easier over time with practice and iteration. You'll, you'll pare it down to what you really need and maybe start building it back out as you discover that it's working or not working for you. And this also gives you your state gate definitions. I don't know how much you guys know about process flow, but as you're moving the proposal onward, you need to decide, do, do we need an engineering review and do we need a, a legal review? Do we need a review from service if you're, if you're, if you're including services or our service company? So that everything gets reviewed by the proper people and they sign off on it before you move it along. And you do need to get all those signs and sign offs and approvals before you ship. And of course, also too, when you're saving a um, electronic copy of your response as you are use, reusing uh, the data that you've collected and rewritten and perf perfected, you're going to be reusing it and the process will also get easier and speedier and you can relax more about corporate information, executive overview, letter of transmittal, because that's stuff already done and you can pretty much reuse it. And yeah, it makes life a whole lot easier. Uh, there's a bunch of resources I've collected that you can use. Um, again, don't, you don't have to write down the URLs for this because this, the slides will be available. Uh, there's a small company that's nationwide that provides as-needed general counsel. These are all people with lots and lots of experience and they work hourly and they're you know, usually a pretty good group, almost all of them have corporate experience. On their website you can see who they are, what their experience is, and how it maps to what you're needing. Uh, there's a group out there called Shipley that will help with proposals. They do proposal training, they do proposal contracting, they can help you if you're willing to go with them. Uh, they're pretty useful. Uh, Darpa Cyber Fast Track, if you've been coming to ShrewCon, you know about them. Uh, is Mudge here this year? Uh, Peter Mudge. Anyway, um, they do uh, smaller funding. It's not so much sales as development. They will help you with money. Their proposal process is only a page or two. It's a lot easier. Um, one of the things is a small company too. You are looking at small business set-asides. Now the really cool thing about small business set-asides for all large government contracts, <coughs> they have a requirement that 23% goes to small businesses. A small business is any company with a um, revenue of less than five million. If you make more than five million, I really want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> but the small business set aside is really cool. There's a way to get in on that. And also too, if you're paying attention to who's been getting government contracts, you can find out who 
you want to contact and say, hey, we want to be your small business that you, that you propose with next time out. Start looking for these people because they can be really useful to get your toe in. Because you're not the prime contractor, you're the subcontractor, you're going to be making a big chunk of the change and you're going to be helping yourself make a sale that the big guy is actually guiding. And typically when you are the subcontractor, what you're doing is very much the exact same RFP, it's just you're answering it as your own company and it's added to and of the larger company's um, RFP response. Um, if you need help being a small business, uh, the, there's a small business agency that's part of the federal government, and there's also the government has got this wonderful, wonderful website out there for finding RFPs and RF, you know, RFQs to respond to. Uh, you can search through it by uh, area, by um, what your expertise is by locality. It's, it's very, very searchable. It's got a pretty hot search engine. Um, and I kind of recommend it. It's, it's a cool thing to do. Just especially start reading that too because you're looking to see what people are looking to buy. And also I've included in the slides because I'm hoping you all will you know, go online to grab the slide set a quick glossary of terms that you might need to know in order to pull off this chunk of business. Um, by the way, the task order is mostly just used for uh, government stuff and it's a blanket contract that's talk to your lawyer before you do a task order kind of uh, proposal because it can get a little hairy. And that's basically it. I've probably rushed through way fast and I hope you all are, you know, not kind of thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? So are there any questions? Oh boy, I kind of see somebody in the... I might have missed it. I, I, I don't know if I got here late or not. I didn't get an introduction from you and your background and uh, what your experience is. Okay, um, I've spent so about 25 years in marketing in large technical corporations. I spent 10 years doing just proposals. Uh, so I think I've got a little cred on that. Uh, I've got a ridiculous winning, um, if I can pat myself on the back, a pretty good winning record. <laughs> Uh, record and um, when I was looking at what was going on with the Schmoo Group, I realized that uh, a lot of companies are springing up out of the Schmoo community and you might need a little bit of um, somebody who's played with the big boys who can kind of help people grow their business some and turn it into a real growing concern. Does that answer your so question? So you're, you're doing this kind of stuff as a consultant now or are you just trying to um, share your knowledge? I'm mostly sharing my knowledge. If you want to talk about consultancy, wait till I get off the podium. <laughs> okay. Um, in the front here? Yes. Um, I've been on the FPO sites and I've been looking at some of the things. A lot of the information is very terse. It doesn't seem that it caters to young startup companies, which I think the majority of people in this session would be uh, four to ten size startups and having the established structure that you said in your in the presentation. How are we supposed to interpret that if uh, a young startup company could actually uh, bid and propose on these things from the, the experience and the stuff that you've seen, uh, that you've talked about today? Okay, if I understand your question, it's basically that a lot of the RFPs come out and they're too terse and give insufficient information to figure it's out. It's not that it's insufficient information. It seems that if it would be something where a, a four-person team, a business team, may not be able to handle because, you know, it might be, let's just say it might be installing IPS IDSs. They, there's a, an RFP for that. Uh, RFP for that. And it seems like you know, you, there's a six month period for to do that. But it seems, for me, it would seem like, okay, number one, I have to be a reseller. Or actually, number one, I have to be a small established business. Number two, I have to be a reseller. And number three, I have to be able to support the product. So I was just wondering, from your experience with working with other people and the information we present today, does that seem kind of to be the actual that they're really looking for more established small businesses, not necessarily people from the school group or something like that? Um, they often are looking for <coughs> establishment or if you're new, the ability to continue, which often means you have a larger partner. 
uh, who is the prime contractor. This might be a situation where being a subcontractor is to your advantage because then you get to coattail and use the experience and the, the cred and the continuation that is offered by the prime. Uh, they will use you um, for getting the business, filling in the holes, uh, very possibly too if you're a local company to them and they're trying to get a government contract that's, that's locally based, you, that's a good niche that you can possibly populate. Um, but you mostly, if you're looking to go alone with that kind of uh, installation business, um, you, are you actually looking at large business customers? I, I think from what I understand, it sounds more like you, you need a, a better definition of what you supply to whom. Okay, uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, how does it relate to when you're trying to look for a research grant opportunities? A research grant? Yeah, if you want to be a, an organization that uses grant funding to do research in cybersecurity or, or, or computational services like that. Uh, okay, research grants um, are very similar to proposals. You have to look for them and respond to them. Uh, I might direct you at uh, the DARPA Cyber Fast Track because they do a lot of research funding. Okay. Um, I think they currently go up to what, 250 million? Uh, 250,000, duh. Uh, I wish. <laughs> yeah, really? They were only like that. Yeah, so I, it's, it's a pretty good chunk of money, and it's my understanding that that can often. Uh, after you've done a, a chunk of uh, DARPA, DARPA cyber fast track uh, research that gives you enough to really kick the company off because you've got a war chest. Okay. 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 Is it is it safe? Is it a game uh, I saw more hands. Okay, in the back there. So you, during the request phase, this is just for like the government side. You said that the playing field is kind of level when it comes to companies trying to sell and uh, get those RFPs in. Well, there's a couple of ways to sidestep that. Like, there's a company called uh, GovTech. They have a conference called GTRA every year that introduces like small businesses, as well as large businesses, to these government organizations, so that you can write those requests to match the company. Oh. And it kind of because if you put out that request, anybody has the ability to write it, but they have to fit it perfectly. But what they do is. They write that uh, request to perfectly match your company because if they really love your product, because that playing field may be level, but anybody can put up that open bid and they always go to that lowest bidder, which kind of throw things. Okay, I wasn't familiar with that. This is GovTech? It's called GovTech, yeah, that's the company, but GTRA is what you want to go to, and that introduces any kind of company, big, large, and small companies to the government organization. Okay, EPRA? GPRA. 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 Ray Alpha. Okay. And I don't, I just realized I don't have the projector up here, so never mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Yes. I also wanted to mention like SBIR.gov if you're interested in doing phase one research, like if you're coming out with something unique, completely new, you're like advancing your thesis if you were a master's student um, or a PhD student, you could just go to SBIR and mm -hmm. post your own project and see if the government likes that. Cool. And they have their own things as well. I created an app for Windows Phone for that. It's called ah, Windows. okay. So uh, do, we, do we have uh, more information we wish to share to help each other <laughs> reap the benefits of technology? <laughs> uh, back there again. Yeah. So uh, you also said stuff about the small businesses that you can like, customize your businesses so that you're underneath a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, for government stuff too, you can have like a hub zone, which is if you have your company in a certain area that's like a low population of funding, you can you instantly get government grants for it. Oh. And nice. also, you can be, if you're not just a small company, but like minority-owned, uh, woman-owned, um, like yes. any, any kind of like really minority group, they will pick you way over anybody else because that's, they need to fit this requirement of minority 
groups. Right, yeah, because yeah. part of the government has a set aside not just for small businesses, but also for small and disadvantaged businesses. And that's, if you're a woman, yes? I, I was just going to say that one of the reasons to go for a, a, a proposal that you don't win is if you are a minority owned or a women owned and the, the, com the competitors who see you may, may well see that you've been there a couple of times, even though you didn't make it, you may become a subcontractor target for them. So there are strategic times to apply, to, to, to get in there and fail, but to become a, a known player. And, and that can also work. Yes. Um, I'm seeing into the light. Do we have more? Go into the light. OK, yes. <laughs> I uh, didn't really go through formal. Run that one by me again? I'm on the other side where I'm in a mid sized company that uh, we don't have to draw a bill yet. So, you know, it's a usual one. It's a usual one. Okay, you're, you're, a, you're with a buyer company or a seller company? You're with a buyer company. Um, well, you know, you probably have a purchasing department. You probably have, you don't have a purchasing Okay, I would really recommend that before you make any purchases, unless of course you're buying like pencils, uh, to really come up with what your requirements are because otherwise you're going to be blowing a lot of money on stuff that doesn't fulfill your needs. I've done that a lot over the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the thing. But we're starting to do that now, but it's cumbersome. We've never really done it before. We don't have this yeah, the problem with all of these procedures are they seem cumbersome, and the only thing that's worse is not doing them and discovering that you've just done something you really didn't want to do because you didn't think hard enough about it. Uh, this is just if you're selling, if you're buying, you know, really put thought into it. You know, pretend you're buying a car and spending your own money. Um, so is there anybody else out in there? And did I, did I answer or was I like too mean to you? I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just, I wish there was something more like a book I could read about or something. You know, there probably is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, there there are also you know some some teaching books on on how to write RFPs, which is a whole different art. Because um, some companies sit down and put together a committee and write an RFP, uh, you know, really thinking well about what the requirements are going to be. And then there's the horrible sneaky thing that I admit, oh my God, what a horrible person I have done, which is write RFPs as the selling company that the salesman gives to the purchasing company that gets incorporated in the RFP that's eventually released. Some of my coworkers have done that, and I don't like it. It's, it's, you know, it's not what we need. It's, you know, yeah, well, you know, it, it helps um, slightly skew the sales process, but if indeed it does ask questions and uh, help formulate what the problem really is, it is, it is a useful thing. It's just you have to be, um, you, you don't have to, take the whole thing, go through it carefully, and just use the questions that are genuinely useful and speak to you. I personally don't like it, but it is, it's one of the sales techniques that's in use out there, what can I say? Okay, anybody else out there? God. I think we're done for now, I thank you. Oh, hold on, hold on. I just wanted to uh, ask, where were you gonna post your slides, and what was your contact information? Because I didn't see it on the slides. Okay, um, there is, uh, I think it what, goes on to the Shmoo website after the, after the show. Because I have to like, give them my little USB and prove that I was really here. <laughs> um, I think I'm really here. Uh, oh, right, I'm, there's pictures in Israel. Okay. Yeah, like, I didn't see email or address on those slides. Okay, I, I, can, I can take care of that. I, okay. I, I do have email. I, I am that modern, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you all so very, very much. Do I, do I have a thank you, sir?